Hello and welcome to Journeys and Journals. I'm Bernie Martin Beck and I get to talk to people about history. And this is going to be the object of our discussion today. A history lover who kept, what is this tool? Please. That was an um, instrument that my mother used when she worked in the pear canneries up in uh, Yakima, Washington, this before she was married. Oh, um, so we're talking 19 and? 1928 was when they were married, so it was oh. in the late 1920s. Well, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about Mom. Okay. Um, I'm Claudia Wagner, and uh, my uh, parents were Marion and Hazel Eels. And they lived here back and forth from about 1930, and then they moved back to Idaho, and then they moved back here. And I was born here in, and as a native Grants Pass person. Uh -huh. So I'm one of the very, very rare people who was actually born here in Josephine County. <laughs> okay, lady. <laughs> so we made We're it. We're Southern Oregon Webfoot. Well, now yes. this is back in Idaho days, is that right? That was uh, in the trip, they had moved over here in 1930s and then moved back in about 1940. And my father built a, a gas station over in southern Idaho and they lived in the back of the, the gas station store. And so my mother kept a diary. She, while she was doing the books in the evenings after the day's business, she would just go ahead and write down in her diary and write a journal of the things that had happened. Five-year <laughs> diary, that just... Uh covers from uh, from four different years huh? four. well this this is actually two two separate ones so it goes from 1944 until i believe it goes to 1949. would, oh, would she sorry. have ever guessed that here it would be on tv around the world no why, why don't you <laughs> read this one to me i just think it's uh, well this is idaho this was in Idaho. Um, she, as, as she was actually putting it in, she said, uh, this was in March 6th of 1944. She said, I spent the forenoon working on an income tax report uh, and a cranky baby. Marvin went, or Marion went to Boise, that was my dad's name. Marion went to Boise this afternoon and bought a refrigerator. Ooh. An important thing <laughs> for the, that particular time. <laughs> um, most of the things that she wrote about was ordinary things that had happened uh, yeah, like during the day and like I say, doing the income tax report or doing the inventory for the store. And, or doing the washing for you? Well, no. this was before I was there. Oh, okay. uh, this was, this was um, well before I was born, but yes, every week. Monday was her wash day, Tuesday was her ironing day, so that was every week so on this oh, one was obviously a monday was march 14th it says cold again wash day and the clothes froze on the line i bet some of you people watching can recognize that <laughs> you came from minnesota where mom froze the clothes dry freeze dry has a different a whole different meaning <laughs> when you were doing laundry that way what's this picture about this was a picture of um family that my my father went to work for the Jerome family at their uh, sawmill over around Madras. Um, they had a, a sawmill over there and and while he was bef just before he was married he was as a young man he worked around various places in the woods worked for different ones and so he he went over to Madras and he was working with them at their sawmill over there and this was this was the family that was standing out on a log in the middle of the log pond. Well, that is a log, a yes. great big log. It was a big log. They had big logs back that time. I remember watching the guys in uh, entertaining themselves, trying to knock one another off of these rolling logs. And these children grew up around logging ponds, and they were perfectly fine standing out on a log in the water. You kind of do this, just walk on a log and then faster and faster and hopefully the, <laughs> your um, a competitor 
would fall off and you'd be standing and then of course the applause just like any <laughs> and I'm and I'm sure as children they probably had some times when they did that too but I think mother and dad were pretty their mother and dad were pretty careful about making sure that they didn't <laughs> get too carried away because n no one wore life jackets or oh <laughs> the the whole idea of looking back at history from our viewpoint and with our eyes today is so very different. When you go back, you have to look at the things, the, the safety measures that they didn't have. You either made it or you didn't. You either survived or you didn't. But you had to be careful with what you did. Yeah, you and learned at a very early age. You learned at a very early age that if you did dangerous things, um, you would probably get hurt. <laughs> now, this is home. This is this was the home. This was uh, my parents moved back here in 19, the, actually the winter of 1945. So this was 1946. This was our home out on Laurel Avenue, out in the Jerome Prairie area, and this was actually where we lived until 1970s. In this um, little house. In this little house, and we started out. Uh, Mom and Dad had um, nine children. And oh my so the older boys, when they moved over here, were in high school. So they were almost at the age where they were ready to leave home, but not quite. So, and then I came along a few years after this, but I was born in that home. That's, I was actually that's had a home where birth. Way our women, way women did it. Did you they did. have a midwife or? We did. We had we had midwives that were there. Um, that was our, our family, I mean, and we didn't think anything at all about the fact that all of the boys, there were five boys, um, all except the littlest one, the, little, the two littlest children, by the time when they came along, they usually slept in bunk beds or something in mom and dad's room. The girls had one room, the boys had the upstairs attic. And if you had three people to a bed, oh well. That was okay. You didn't everyone have their own room. Right. <laughs> and you didn't always everybody have your own bed. So it, you, it, you one, shared. <laughs> one family I heard, there were three kids in the bed, so one had their feet that way and two had their feet this way. I don't think we ever did that, but we usually had at least one of the smaller ones that was in there. So we had two teenage maybe and one that was smaller that would be in, in there. Now you've gone to all the trouble to put this all together. This is the family story, right? This is the family story. This is pages and pages <laughs> of pictures. It, it really is. This one, um, my daughter came up with this idea. I was always saying, well, oh, mommy used to say something, whatever it was, mama used to say. And she would say, I never got a chance to meet her. They had all, they'd both, mom and dad had both passed away before I was married and before I had children. She said, I never got a chance to meet them. And you're always telling me all of these wonderful things that your mother said. Would you put them in a book, please? I need oh. to learn to know oh. them. So that's what I did for Christmas this last year. I made this book up for, the, for the, uh, my children and so that they could have something to know and learn a little bit about their grandparents. Wow. in our early life. Are you for hire? <laughs> <laughs> I love doing that kind of thing. So I'm now, working right now on, on my husband's side of the family, though, on the Wagner side of the family. Which um, their story's just marvelous. It's it, from Jackson County? Um, in Jackson County, they were there, but they came from, the early ones came from Russia. They were um, uh, Delmer and, and uh, Ed's family way back uh, in the 1800s came over from, they were born in Russia, they were German immigrants born in Russia. And they came over to South Dakota and stayed in there and then eventually came out here. And so I'm still finding interesting things about their family and finding out what was going on with that too. Oh, the part that you shared with me that mom did it alone. Their mother did it alone, yes. Her husband was killed when she was very young. Well. Uh, my husband, Ed, was the oldest one. He was eight years old when his father was killed. Um, there was a, he was riding his bike in, in Ashland and a car um, hit him 
and it injured him enough that he, he died from his injuries. We just don't think about and how, you know, how did she do it without all the, mm. Well, and she had some tough times. She told me one time that, um, she said, I just was down to the point where I had no money. And she said, I had to borrow $20 from my mother. But she said, I paid her back. <laughs> she made sure that she was a very independent lady. And she taught school for the um, Oregon uh, Seventh Day Adventist Conference. And um, that was how she made her living to take care of the children. But she except lived, for raising gardens. She lived way out in the country. She did. Now, this book is so fantastic. You've done something. Usually, these group pictures, you know, you turn them over, you try to match them up. But you've matched up. The name's right here. Yes. So it's easy to read. I, I'm sure people who are into this uh, would like these tips about you and these books. I mean, they're just just full of goodies, pictures, pictures. Well, I, we have a lot of family pictures. That was one of the things that was very important. My mother was very, very adamant that of anything else, whether they had to do out without some things, we had pictures of family that was so important to her. And um, my family was very close. And so dad's brothers and sisters and everyone, they visited back and forth. And when they couldn't visit, they sent pictures. That's what this is about, isn't that's it? That's what that is about. This was when I was about five years old. And we made a trip to, uh, in 1955, to Idaho to visit family. And this was the air conditioning unit for our car because, of course, there was no air conditioning in the cars. And our whole family, this was um, some of my brothers and some of my cousins. We got pictures of all of us in that way. But we had eight people that were in this car that went from Grants Pass to Idaho, about 500 miles, I think I figured, all in that one little car. Um, of course, there was no seat belt rules. So you didn't worry about seat belts, but I think we were packed in there so tightly, I don't think we would have went anywhere, even if we would have had an accident. Now, you were just a little girl. So do I you remember this? I do remember it. Um, we, there were so many exciting things because as a child, I didn't travel very much, but we got a chance to go there. I remember it being very warm. And I remember I got to sit in the front seat with mom and daddy, and I got to sit on top of a small box that we had for a lunchbox. Mom always took snacks because knew we would be hungry and things going on and picnic lunch or whatever. And I got to sit on the box. So of course, every time anybody needed a snack, I had to get stand up in the seat so that they could get the snack. But I got to sit in the front seat that way. <laughs> lunchbox, literally. I got to sit on the lunchbox, actually a box. Uh, here's a beautiful picture. You've got a story. This was uh, my next to the oldest brother, Delbert. When they moved back over here in 46, he was in high school. So at age 16, he started working for the forestry crew. This is the forestry camp up at Kirby. And this was the fire crew that he worked at. This was my brother here and the two of the other. So he worked every summer for the US forestry um, until he went into the service in, in uh, 1954. Four, I believe it was, and uh, but but he worked for the forestry all of this time, and a lot of the time was out in the Kirby area. Um, I think they they was actually out at the smoke jumper right. base is that in Cave Junction, and this is where this was taken. Look at this. So it has the the tower, the where they practice their jumps, and it's literally the these smoke jumpers. They parachuted into the fires sometimes, a lot of times. And they would have to, to do that. And he, he did train that. And then after he was older, um, I, he had worked so many years as a, on the crew that in 1959, when he was married, he and his wife took over and worked the Pleasant Creek uh, Forestry Station. And he was the head of the cruise up there. He, he had a cruise every summer. You know, folks, if you don't know about forest fires, they were a scary thing. 
They still we, are. <laughs> they still are. But we didn't have borate planes, and we didn't have all the things. And it was uh, life-threatening. Very. I, and it was just downright scary. I, I really was. And, the, and they didn't. They didn't really have um, a lot of the spotters that they, uh, the electronic spotters and the things that oh, they no. have now. So uh, he was up in the Pleasant Creek area, and at that time they had the lookout towers on almost all of the mountains around here. Right. They had one on Battle Mountain. It was just up Sykes Creek from where we were, and they had one up on Sexton. And he used to interface by radio with the, the people in the lookout towers, and they would report any fires. But they would also help because they were stationed there all summer long. They had to be there through the whole fire season. And so if they needed supplies, he and the crew would go up and take them supplies up to their, their lookout towers. And so he, he had very good rapport with all of the people that were on the lookout and towers. And my father-in-law, Keith Beck, would go up to those to fix their radios. Even at forest fires, he would have to go in and, oh, and uh, fix it was scary them. times. It was. It was. We, you know, we've seen fires elsewhere, but somehow here, you could just look up at the mountain and it would seem to be ablaze. Yes. Absolutely. We hope that won't happen thanks to the airplanes and all. But you, still you brought tr a, a picture here that I've never seen. And the likes of? This was, my father loved to go to the ocean. Uh, oh. He had a wonderful time. He would go down fishing. And this was, was my father and mother and uh, my older sister and grandchildren. And this was down along what is now the north, they call it the North Bank Road between um, Highway, the Redwood Highway and Highway 101. That, that cut off that goes over to the coast. And this was the way the trees were along there uh, most of the time, well, I remember. They were huge. That's a tree. That is a and huge tree. And these people are five, six foot tall. Probably, yeah. And so, and so it's, it's across seven or eight or nine. It feet. was, it, they were huge. They were absolutely huge. And most all of that was all logged off because they did not put it into the preserve at that time. Mm -hmm. They did have a few of them that they left in the Jedediah Park, but this was before, and this was what, as they started well, logging. Well, the road, it. folks, you would drive down and there'd be two giant redwood trees. And I'm sure as they kept growing, that road get, gets narrower <laughs> and there. And it, you had to stop and let somebody else through. I mean, it was a one, but it was and beautiful, and we loved to go down there because of all of the, the beautiful... And we called like it the, the cutoff because we could get to Smith River and the Fishers in better time than to go down that crooked road into Cave Junction, uh, Crescent. Crescent City, and back up. Right. Uh, you brought... Oh, there's your lunchbox. This, yes, it's a little hard to see maybe, but there is uh, a little box that was sitting in the front seat, and I would, I would sit on it. it I thought it was huge, but I suppose it was because I was very, very little at the time. But, uh, um, but that was pretty nice. Now here's another picture. Oh my! Once you got there, once we got to the coast, this was this was the way we would have our picnic. We would camp out on the sand, um, that most of the time. Uh, at the time we were allowed to do that, and this was a picnic. This was my mother. This was me. Actually, I was about six years old. My mother never wore trousers until probably about 1980. Every time she would go to the coast, she always wore long, uh, longer skirts, at, even out at the beach, everything, with scarfs on our heads, make sure everything was there. And we would camp out on the sand. We didn't have good sleeping bags. We didn't have it. We took the bedding from the house. So all of the sand would come home with us. <laughs> Oh. My mother absolutely hated to go to the coast because of that, because there was so much work involved. And they would cook over open campfires, and Daddy would take, a, he had a big uh, a dip net, and they would go down when the smelt would run, and they would go out into the waves and take this big net. It was a big Y-shaped, and it had a big uh, net down here, with a crossbar across it, and they would go out and dip it into the, w into the waves as the smelt were coming in, and they would come down, and they would catch them by the by the big wash tub loads. And then they would 
clean them there on the beach and we would cook them and eat them until we couldn't eat any more and then bring the rest home and put them in the lockers. We, we would have them in freezer oh, locker. lockers. That's a word you don't hear much anymore. They don't use those anymore because everyone has their own home freezers. Freezers. But that was what it was. It was a, it was a commercial freezer that we could use. Down in the bottom of your pictures, your wonderful pictures, was this one. But where does that fit in in the timeline? Well, this one was prior to all of these. This was in about 1934, 35, somewhere. This was taken up around Wilderville. Um, just, well, it was what my mother used to call up the canyon. They, <laughs> there was a small uh, sawmill up there, the Krause Brothers Sawmill, and they lived in a sawmill shack back over here with the small children, and this was their home. It was up by Wilderville. This was my uncle had come over on a trip from Idaho and went down to the coast and caught a big skate, one of the big uh, manta ray type things. Oh. But this was his trailer house. This was his camp trailer that he had um, pulled behind his, his car sitting back over here. That's the way they did things then. <laughs> and, and, and this, uh, is this that built was, out of that bark? Was, well, not bark, but it was rough wood. It was rough plywood, or not plywood, but rough planks. Yeah, because the first plank, the first cut off of a tree was really not worth very much because they were looking for real lumber. So they built these houses. And my, my mother always had this very, very <sighs> abhorrence, you might say, to this beautiful knotty pine paneling that they put into houses in the 50s and everything. It was beautiful. She, she just could not stand it. She said, I want a nice painted w uh, wall in my house. I've lived in too many shacks with too many real knot holes. <laughs> <laughs> she could not, she didn't like those very much at all. Fashion. Fashion changes. Definitely. You've just, you've got volumes of things here that fascinate me. Which paths do we go next? Oh, that's a very interesting idea. I don't know. I can, I can get scattered on a lot of things because I love history, as you, know, as you can tell, <laughs> and my family history and the family stories because that's, to me, what history is about. It's the stories of people. And that's what, I, that's what I love the most is because the fact that we can find out what things were really like because we read it in books and we think about, oh, this is just something that happened to somebody. But these happened to our people. These were our families. These were our ancestors. They were all there. They were all there somewhere. And it doesn't get much better. No, I think it's wonderful because when we, f we trace back and we find out, oh, our families were at Shiloh. Our families were in the colonies when they first came over. Our families went back to the old world, back to Europe, back to, to Russia, back to wherever. These were our people. And yours came early to this new world. My father's family. My father's family came over in 1630. Oh. <laughs> so we traced it back. They came over from Barnstable, England, um, as part of the pilgrims, um, pilgrim movement. And uh, so some of the others, some of the Wagner family, they didn't come over until the 1800s. But they all had an exciting uh, time when they were coming to here for a new life. And it, it was... It's very interesting to trace it down and find out who they were and what was going on. Pioneer folk. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'd, you'd have to have a real zest for life to succeed in this. Oh, they did. And, and I think about I think what I got started was with my sister read me the diaries of the first white women to come across, the Whitmans and the Eelses which obviously, since I was an Eels, this made it very special to me. Uh -huh. And to read the diaries of these women who left the East with no expectation of ever seeing their parents again. Now, your sister was reading this, and you were how old? Oh, I was probably eight or nine. So this is like bedtime stories, and she's oh, telling. Oh, yes, and absolutely. And <laughs> loved it. 
Absolutely. I, I've loved history from way back then because learning about the people and learning about what was going on with them. Yeah. Well, last night as I was talking pre-show, um, I could hear your husband commenting on different, he, he has a tremendous, tremendous memory for things and he well, gave, sometimes. <laughs> uh, he was filling in details that on his on his family history and from when he grew up in, in this area. Well, my buddy Bill Young, who passed away, and he loved Sykes's Creek. That was how he pronounced it, and he was there in the during the flu epidemic of nineteen and about nineteen eighteen. When and you know, and he said nothing but rocks grew there. I don't <laughs> well, I think he's a little wrong with that because we've had very nice orchards and gardens, and and that was where um, uh, my husband and his family, his mother, raised garden, and that's she canned it all, and that was what they what they lived on. They through the whole winter, that was what their their food from. So, it's very exciting stories. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, doesn't this just rub off and you want to know more about your roots and where you came from and how it happened? And most people, they think, well, I'm not sure if I want to know <laughs> because what if my family were the horse thieves? or the? But, you know, they're still exciting and they're still interesting, no matter who they are. And that's what I found with my family. I mean, I haven't found any that I personally know maybe we're horse thieves, but maybe they were. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> well, at horse thief or not, you know, we have uh, these roots that we are so grateful because it's part of what makes our tree, our family tree, strong. It is. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you'll come back again because if you can bring this a second time, what will you have the third and fourth times? We have, I have a whole room and a whole uh, file cabinet of things. Oh, and Bernie is so happy to hear that because she loves history the way I do, about the people and the stories. I hope you'll ask Grandma and Grandpa those stories if you're lucky enough to have them. I'm Bernie Martin Beck saying thanks for tuning in. <laughs>